junior church at this time. Well, the history behind the ancient city of Ephesus is really quite interesting. In the Apostle Paul's day, back in the first century, the city of Ephesus was a prominent and highly influential port city located on the western edge of Asia Minor, as the modern state of Turkey. The city's origin precede both Greek and Roman rule all the way back to around the 11th century BC when an Ionian prince by the name of Androclos turned to an oracle at the city of Delphi. Tradition holds that the oracle told the prince that a boar and a fish would reveal to him the city or the location of his new city. Not long after this, as this prince was cooking a fresh catch of fish in a frying pan over an open flame, one of the fish flopped out uh, into the bushes and ignited a small fire, and a wild boar ran out. A very interesting tale. Recalling the oracle's message, Androclos established his new settlement at that location and named it Ephesus. Pretty interesting. What's more interesting is that in time, the city of Ephesus became the home of a massive temple and cult of the goddess Artemis, known in Roman religion as Diana. Now, Diana was the daughter, uh, legendary daughter, of Zeus and Leto, who had a twin brother by the name of Apollos. You're probably familiar with that Greek god's name. Well, uh, Artemis was the goddess of wild animals, maybe going back to that boar, vegetation, virginity, and childbirth, even associations with uh, the moon. Well, uh, this goddess was worshipped and sought after by generations of Greeks, pagans, and Romans after them. The temple to Artemis cast quite literally a long and dark shadow over this city, both literally and metaphorically. What's clear from the history is that Ephesus was deeply entrenched in idolatry and magical practices up to and including that fateful time when the Apostle Paul rode into town on his third missionary journey in the early 50s AD, just two decades after the death and resurrection of Jesus. To that point, the book of Acts, particularly in chapters 19 and 20, records for us really the power struggle that occurred between Paul's Ephesian ministry and the forces of Satan there in Ephesus. And what is one of the more bizarre accounts in the book of Acts, the second volume of the ministry and mission of the resurrected King Jesus, Dr. Luke writes in Acts 19 verse 11 and following, that God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the name of Jesus, whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon all of them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Fear fell, and his name was extolled. Verse 18, also many of those who are now believing came, and notice, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. That would have equated to around $6 million today. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. What is that all about? The power of the gospel at work in a dark and godless city. That's what that's about. God's truth transforming the spiritual landscape of Ephesus. Now, I think we need to keep in mind that Paul stayed in Ephesus between two and three years, according to the narrative of the book of Acts. This was most likely his longest 
And again, probably his most fruitful and effective period of settled ministry in any one particular location. The gospel of the risen Jesus was mightily at work in Ephesus through Paul and his co-laborers in the gospel. Paul was catching his own sort of fish, you might say, there in the city of Ephesus. Luke records a summary, in a sense, in Acts chapter 19, verses 8 through 20, about Paul's Ephesian ministry, where he writes, And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. Notice verse 10, this continued for two years so that all of the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Not only Ephesus, but many of the surrounding towns and cities were transformed by this word. What word? What was this word that Paul deployed as a weapon to change hearts and transform minds in the territory of Asia? What was the source, the true source of spiritual power in the hands and on the lips of the mighty apostle of grace named Paul? Was it not this? Was it not the gospel of Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead? As Paul memorably declares in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek The gospel, beloved, is the dynamite of divine truth, breaking down barriers of unbelief and raising dead sinners to new life in Christ. Again, was it not the message of Jesus' cross? As Paul says to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1, 18, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Or again, later, Paul says in his second letter to the Corinthians, he outlines his strategy in seeking gospel preeminence. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. It is only the gospel of Jesus that topples man's folly. Only the gospel. The message of Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead, though foolishness to many Greeks and a stumbling block to masses of Jews, it was the dynamite setting off an explosion of divine truth and gospel transformation in the city of Ephesus through Paul's witness. He says to the Romans, or sorry, 1 Corinthians 4.20, for the kingdom of God does not consist in mere talk, but in power. Not in mere talk, but in much power. So what happened? What happened in Ephesus? Why now, despite the good report that we looked at last week on the part of many Ephesians, now about 10 or so years after Paul had left Ephesus, why was the city in need of a reminder of gospel power? Why do we find the apostle Paul here praying to God to turn the lights back on? that the church might understand that Jesus Christ is their Lord. Listen, how could a church that had been planted by Paul and pastored by young Timothy and even overseen by the Apostle John, not to mention having received a special word of warning by the risen Christ himself in Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, how could such a church lose its progress? or ever lack in power? Well, it's easier easier than you might imagine. We all have a tendency, don't we, towards spiritual complacency, lethargy, apathy, and inertia, do we not? If we don't pursue Christ faithfully, we will recede from Christ as we're carried back by the world. Let me ask you this morning, are we at peak power as a church today? Probably not. Probably not. 
Why not? Why not? What about the state of your salvation, your vitality in Christ? Are you powerful or powerless? That is, are you growing daily, even dynamically? Are you going obedient, even faithfully, through the divine power of God's Holy Spirit within you? Or is your life unplugged and rather impotent this morning? Do we see a power surge or a power outage among us? A.W. Tozer famously said, God is looking for people through whom he can do impossible things. What a pity that we plan only the things that we can do by ourselves. Friends, the fact of the matter is that God has designed our discipleship to be more like a living room lamp that has to be remain, that has to be plugged in, in to its power source to stay illuminated rather than a cell phone that can be thrown on the charging station from time to time and then we use it until the battery runs out of power. We need to be like that lamp plugged in. Here at the end of his first great prayer for the Ephesians, Paul reminds us that the way to overcome our discouragement, which will come, the way to defeat uh, our our feelings of self-doubt, which will come, our periods of intense, deep disillusionment in life, which are nearby, is to remember the real source of our strength. It is to remember our salvation. It is to remember Jesus Christ and the power of God that comes through him, the power that comes through the God who raised his son from the dead. As Paul says in Colossians 1, 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul's prayer for us this morning, as God's chosen and redeemed and sealed people by his spirit, is for us to see more clearly, as we've looked at the last couple of Sundays, our, the hope of our call, calling the riches of our inheritance, and now, thirdly and finally today, the mighty power through the gospel of the living Lord Jesus Christ who has been raised from the dead and seated above all rival powers and authorities as the gracious master and supreme head over his church. In other words, friends, in verses 19 to 23 this morning, here Paul expounds, elaborates, and expands upon this third element of his prayer for the Ephesians. And for us this morning, by extension, that we might know wonderfully and effectively, verse 19, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. Do you feel God's power today? Notice Paul does this by making an important link or connection between God's power, once again, in raising his own son from the dead with his unique ability and resources in our lives today as Christians. We have access now into resurrection power through Jesus Christ. Eternal life is not just quantitatively different, it's qualitatively different. It's not merely a matter of duration, how many years we will live in heaven. It's a matter of transformation now. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, as Paul records in Romans 1, 3 to 4, concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, that same power that elevated the Lord Jesus Christ to the Father's right hand of honor and authority and majesty and power is the one and the same power in mercy that makes us alive by grace and through faith in the gospel. That power is in us. It's in us. As Paul says in Ephesians 2, 6, that raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Jesus. Listen, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the power grid behind all our righteousness and good deeds. It's the power grid. There's no resource apart from him. Or to put it more simply, our eternal life, starts now. It starts here by faith in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul got that. He said in Colossians 1, 28 and 29, him we proclaim, 
warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works in me. Paul knew his ministry was not his own. It was the continuation of the risen Christ's ministry in him as a jar of clay. The risen and ascended Christ has sent his own gracious spirit to take up residence in each of us, to clean us up, to transform, to equip individual bodies and our collective body, the church, in order that we might know and do the will of the Almighty God in heaven. God's ability, his power is above and beyond all other powers, both in heaven and on earth. As one writer aptly said, the Christ who died to save his body now lives forever to serve his body. Amen for that truth. Now look, it's interesting to me as we press into the text a little bit this morning to note that Paul here points out as he piles together, in fact, several Greek terms which taken together press home the unrivaled, even unparalleled nature of the power of God for those who trust in Jesus. It's maybe a little hard to see in the English Bibles in front of us, but look at verse 19 again. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ? Again, in the original language, there are several terms all related to energy and power that leap off the page to us. Dunamis or power, in, uh, iner- uh, energia, you might pronounce it, the working or kratos, the might or iskus, the, the great strength. And when you look at it in the original, you see these terms leaping together. And it's, it's not as if these are different kinds of powers, but there's a cumulative effect that Paul is bringing them together. And he's compressing them and squeezing them together to show show that God's supernatural power is unmatched. It is unrivaled. It's one of a kind sort of power. There is no power on earth like the resurrection power of Jesus. That's Paul's point. And so what is the proof of this power? Pastor, you say the same power lives in us. What's the proof of that? Well, that's what Paul outlines next for us in the text. Notice with me how Paul himself illustrates the immeasurable greatness of this power through four great acts of God. These here are provided to us by Paul in a series of two groupings of two acts each. The resurrection, the ascension, Christ's preeminence, and his leadership of the church. Notice firstly that God's power was put on display when he raised him, Jesus from the dead. Have you seen one of those happen lately? (laughs) Again, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God's one and only Son, is exhibit A of God's power in and over all creation. The resurrection of God's Son is the zenith of divine power displayed here on earth. Again, recall as well what Paul said towards the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 13. When his own apostolic credentials were questioned, what did Paul respond? How did he respond? He said, since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in me, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For he was crucified in weakness, but he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. Again, Paul lost a sense of his own independent identity into the power of Jesus Christ in him. I think we, we do well to do the same. Elsewhere, the Apostle Paul exclaims, my life verse, you saw it printed in the bulletin, uh, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Again, Paul was quite consciously aware of his own life, that his own life had been overtaken by the resurrected Jesus. Do you love that? Or do you resist that and resent it? That is, Paul's life and his ministry were centered squarely on and empowered by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We need to lose a sense of ourselves in Jesus. 
And that's exactly what Paul did. And moreover, practically speaking, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the one and only reason or basis why we can rejoice and take comfort in the face of sickness and sadness and even death. We're all reminded of this just this past week. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Again, on Friday, we were reminded that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the reason why every believer's funeral ends with, uh, with a reminder of resurrection and reunion in heaven. And thank God for it. The point of this first phrase is that the resurrection of Jesus has disabled, even disarmed, the power of death over all who trust in Jesus. The Lord Jesus shared in flesh and blood, the writer of Hebrews says, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Jesus faced and conquered death so that we can share his victory. So look, do you want proof or evidence that God can help you in your marriage, that God can help you in your present bout of depression, that God can see you through this long-standing addiction or any other trial or difficulty? Then remember. Remember that through grace and through faith, In your heart, you have heaven's power. You don't face depression. You don't face a hard marriage. You don't face anything on your own. But you face it with the resources of God above and with his son in your life. God raised the Lord Jesus from the dead, and by his great might, he can raise you out of any trial or any trouble that you face today as well. Because as Christians, we are connected to the resurrection resources of heaven. That power and that authority is unmatched. We will overcome. This raises a good question. Takes us to the second point. Well, where's Jesus now? If Jesus was raised from the dead, why don't we see him walking around? Why don't we see him here and now? Where is Jesus now? Well, I want you to notice that the second proof that Paul gives of God's present ability to strengthen and sustain us as Christians is actually given in the second half of verse 20. Not only did God raise him from the dead, but he has seated him, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Perhaps that you recognize the sad truth that we don't really often think or speak regularly enough about the importance and the power of Christ's heavenly ascension. We speak much of his crucifixion. We speak often of his resurrection, but we seldomly speak of his ascended authority. Remember that 40 days after his resurrection, friends, both in Luke 24 and in Acts 1, the Bible tells us that Jesus lifted up, he went into heaven, and he didn't need Elon Musk's money or a SpaceX rocket to do so, but rather he lifted off to heaven and took his seat of honor and authority far above all rule, all authority, all power, all dominion, even, Paul says, above every created thing both in heaven and on earth, for all time. Paul's point is that the church's power comes from the fact that the Lord Jesus raised him from the dead, and he wasn't done. He is now presently seated in heaven, and he's praying for us. He's ruling over us. Our high commander in heaven is directing and guiding us. Jesus is enthroned in the heavenlies today, church, And so, therefore, we are currently seated with him in heaven. Someone said, the tomb is empty, therefore the throne is not. I love that statement. I love that statement. As Paul says in Colossians 3, 1 through 3, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died. 
and your life is hidden with Christ in God. There should be a sharp break between our BC days, before Christ days, and our days with Christ, as if we have literally died and been raised to new life, Romans 6 verse 4. So listen, Christ is enthroned now over your anxiety, over your discouragement. Jesus is seated as sovereign over your sadness and your present suffering for his name and for his kingdom now. Just think of the practical importance of the fact that he is seated in regal authority now over us. He lives forever to be your Lord and living helper, sending us his spirit to convict us and correct us and console us and to comfort us. Where is Jesus? Someone says he's at the Father's right hand. He's his right hand man. Listen, to be seated at the right hand is to be given the place of royalty, to be given a place of honor, to be given a place of power, What does the writer of Hebrews say? Hebrews 1 verse 3, that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down because his work of redemption was done. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name has, he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. He is preeminent. He is above all. Having finished his work of preaching true righteousness and providing perfect atonement, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3, 22, that Jesus has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. What is your vision of Jesus today? Is he some docile, meek, and mild lamb, or is he a a living, powerful Lord? That's who he is, and that's who he ought to be in our hearts this morning. So listen to me. One of the keys to real, successful, and powerful Christian living today is knowing nothing about us, but something of Jesus, that he is risen and reigning now. He's risen and reigning now over us gloriously and graciously. He has ascended to heaven and is seated at the Father's right hand, waiting the Father's command to bring us home. He has sent the Holy Spirit to help us and is presently interceding on our behalf before the Father. Now, this mighty power of God for Paul in the church has been displayed already three ways, or two ways, and we're going to press the third one a little bit more fully through the resurrection of Christ, and through the exaltation or the ascension of Christ. But notice thirdly in verse 22 that it's also displayed, and you might say Paul elaborates some here, through the preeminence or the supremacy of Christ. Maybe you've heard of the born supremacy. Well, Jesus is the firstborn of the dead in his supremacy and preeminence. I wonder if you picked up on that little word, all, in our passage. The all-encompassing nature of Jesus' heavenly authority. Paul was not exaggerating. This was not hyperbolic language here. Verse 21, Paul says that Jesus is ascended and seated far above, not some rule, but all rule. The word all should be connected to all the other words that follow. All rule, all authority, all power, all dominion, and above every name that is named. Not only in this age, but also in the one to come. All authority and all time, Jesus is above all. He says in verse 22, and he has put all things under his feet. He's above all powers, and all things are going to be subjected under the feet or dominion or rule of Jesus. Friends, he's above every political authority that we we have in our culture. He's above every secular entity in our culture. He's above every religious or ecclesiastical uh, sect or group in our culture, above every uh, educational institution in our culture, above every governmental establishment. Jesus reigns over them all, over them all. There's no doubt in my mind that as Paul is just, his heart is leaping to the Father in prayer 
that Psalm 8 was on his mind. Psalm 8 was on his mind. The connection is just too clear. As he brings into focus the supremacy of God's Son over both creation and the church, he has Psalm 8, maybe verses 5 and following on his mind, yet you have made him, not just a man, but the Son of Man, a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands and have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name, Jesus, above the earth. Think about the domain and dominion that Adam plunged into ruin, has been redeemed and rescued by the second Adam, Jesus Christ, by his resurrection from the dead. Who wears the crown, friends? Who wears the crown now? Jesus does. The crucified, risen, and ascended Son of God is right now reigning. He will reign in the future, visibly upon the earth, but even now he's seated in royal authority. Jesus' death wonderfully redeems the church. We'll come to the church in a moment. But it also brings a cosmic promise of renewal and restoration for the entire universe. Do you get that? The God who spoke all things into existence, who has rescued and provided for renewal through the blood of Christ, he has his affection on you. He wants to bless your life. He wants to change your life. Paul makes this same connection in Colossians 1. Verses 15 and following. Speaking of Jesus, he says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, supreme, the top. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and, to, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. You are not poor, Christian. You are not powerless, believer. We have access to supreme authority. We have a connection to preeminent power in Jesus. The cross of Jesus should be big in our lives, but the cross and the empty tomb of Jesus is much bigger than simply our lives. Jesus is supreme and he's sovereign, and that's what Paul is pointing us to. Jesus is above all things and all powers, including supernatural powers, and this gives a little bit of a preview of coming attractions in Ephesians. All diabolical schemes of Satan that we as believers face today, Jesus is above them. As Paul would say in his prayer, he, he has insight into the resurrection power of Christ here. It anticipates the end of Ephesians, where Paul famously writes, we do this with our children in, in children's church, the armor of God, finally be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might and put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. You waging that warfare, folks? With what weaponry? With what power? Well, you have the weaponry and the power in the resurrected Jesus. Paul assures and reassures in 1 Corinthians 15 that in the end, the Lord Jesus will deliver the kingdom to God, the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 25 to 28. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection, in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he has accepted who put all things in subjection under him. 
when all things are subjected to him, then the Son of himself will also be subjected to him who puts all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Translation, death has its day at the feet of Jesus. Death has its day. The real problem, though, which goes all the way back to the start of today's message, is that men and women, you and I, so often as Christians, tend not to be able to see and appreciate the real power of God put on display. We have it, we don't appreciate it. Listen, I can't see the power that comes out of the outlet on my wall, through the cord to light the light bulb in my room. I can't see that power, but I can tell you when it's on and when it's off. In a similar way, few people were around to see the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and his ascension into heaven, and yet their lives were intended to be evidence or proof of the resurrection power. How does the world see that there is a risen Christ, except when the church shines as it ought to shine? When we look around today in our world, candidly, it seems really hard to tell whether or not Jesus is seated in authority. It's really hard to see that and to notice that. But there is one special place here on earth, one little light bulb in a dim living room of this fallen society where people can see the power of God on full display. And that is us. That is the church. We are a light bulb, friends. And if we are not linked in to the resurrection power of Jesus, we will not let our light shine. But if we are in Christ and his power is pulsating through us, this world will see his light in us. Ephesians 1, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Paul has zeroed in on four manifestations of the unmatched, unrivaled majesty and undefeatable power of God, his resurrection, Jesus' ascension, his supremacy or preeminence above all powers, and fourthly and finally, the beauty and the loving leadership of King Jesus over his church. Listen, the end of Paul's prayer, much like the book of Ephesians itself, concerns the power of the risen and ascended Christ in the life of his people, the church. What does it mean that Jesus is the head of this body? I'll tell you one thing, it means that I'm not, and neither are you. Don't act like it. There's only one head, and you aren't him. Paul will come back to this concept in Ephesians 5, 23 to 24, where he says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. This begins to flesh out and fill in a little bit of what it means to, for Jesus to be the head of this body. Paul's point is that Jesus Christ possesses supreme rank of position in the church. He is the supreme commander and authority in the church. The buck stops with his nail-scarred hands, friends. He is in charge. So rather than bristling at this or under this, this should be a blessed and glorious reality for us as the church. Because our living head wants to fill our hearts this church, his kingdom, and the coming cosmos with his own life and joy and kingdom and peace. And as we submit and surrender to his power and authority in and through our lives, we are energized to know and to do what he delights in. In our service, in our worship, in our witness, as Linda reminded us this morning, in our love, we will shine his life. Christ is our head, and as such, he strengthens us, he provides for us, he directs us, he corrects us in gospel hope that he might have all gospel glory. So I wonder, as we come to the end of this incredibly beautiful opening prayer of Paul, 
Have the eyes of our hearts, even just a little bit, been illuminated to know and display the power of the risen, exalted, supreme, and loving Jesus? I pray that it has. Are we plugged in to the power source of eternal life and thus reflect peace and joy by His Spirit? Are the lights on? I trust that they are. The world may look at us and call us pathetic, but God looks at us and He says, that's my powerful people, my powerful people in Jesus. We are just a bulb, though. We are to be a living lamp, Jesus' life living in us. I close with Charles Spurgeon's comment to his own church from this passage. He concluded by saying, brothers and sisters, go home and never ask the Lord to make you strong in yourselves. Never ask him to make you anything or anybody, but be content to be nothing and nobody. I can do that. Next, ask that his power may have room in you and that all those who come near you may see what God can do by nothings and nobodies and live with this desire to glorify God. May we be a blessed bunch of nobodies and nothings that shines the love and light of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Almighty God and Father, it has been our sincere desire this morning, our plan, our purpose in the organization and arrangement of this service of worship to please one person. And that is you, O oh Lord. It has also been our desire to edify and build up one people. And that is these beloved faces and friends in front of me, Lord. The body of Christ known as Trinity Bible Fellowship Church here in Blandon. Oh God, I pray that you have been honored and that your people have been edified and encouraged. Lord, help us to remember the power of the resurrected Christ living in us. That he is seated in heaven and we are seated with him. There is no threat formed against us that can stand because we have Jesus on our side. Maybe better said, we are on his side. So, Father, thank you for these simple and sweet reminders and help us to live as people who are of the light for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.